As our population ages and healthcare resources continue to be stretched, we need to be sure that we provide the best care in the right place at the right time. It is well documented that over 80% of the population has expressed the wish to die at home. We have a wonderful opportunity as doctors and nurses to work together with other members of the healthcare team to enable patients to die at home in familiar surroundings with their family around them. Caring for patients with life-limiting illness in the home setting is an extremely rewarding experience for the care team and supports the wishes of patients and their families. Palliative care in the home is important to patients and their families because it gives them choices. A healthcare team of their own choosing that respects their values and their wishes while caring for them, surrounded by their own belongings with familiar scents and sounds. We know the home setting reduces anxiety and it brings a sense of the normal to the experience of dying. Palliative care is uh, essential in the healthcare system because really it's a philosophy of care. It's about the journey the patient and the families are taking when they're diagnosed with a life-limiting illness. So the holistic perspective for palliative care involves a multidisciplinary approach to care. So there's multiple team members involved in ensuring that the patient and family symptoms are well managed, that the disease is well managed, and that the patient is receiving the right care in the right place at the right time. So if the patient wishes to be at home right till the end for end-of-life care, we do our best to ensure that that happens and to try to avoid hospital admissions or visits to the emergency department unnecessarily. And that's crucial, that's how the team works. Well, we are able now to manage much more complex symptoms in the home and give treatments that previously were only available in the hospital. And we can actually have very timely management. And this is really important because it prevents patients from long, fatiguing trips to a medical facility, and it reduces the burden on families and prevents the high cost of transportation, arranging time off work, and making it arrangements for babysitting. So really, hospice palliative care is about relieving that suffering when the patient, um, while they're living and as they're dying. And it, that's a key point. Palliative care really is about good symptom management and ensuring that the patient, um, their overall care, the, the mind, the body, the spirit, those aspects, those domains of care, are really well managed in order to ensure that the patient is not suffering while they're dying. But it's about this journey, it's about being diagnosed with a life-limiting illness, and it's wherever they are at that time in their journey with their illness. The following scenes are based on actual case studies representing the stories of families who have experienced palliative care. The roles of Marie and her husband Jake are both portrayed by actors. This is Marie, a 54-year-old patient who was diagnosed over one year ago with advanced metastatic gastric cancer and bilateral pleural effusions. Hi, Marie. I'm Dr. Kelly. It's so good to meet you. Hi, Jake. Good to see you, too. You may wonder why I'm here, but your oncologist, Dr. Gold, asked if I would come around to see you. He told me that you were experiencing more fatigue and yet you were more short of breath. And he asked if I would look after you here at home. Would that be okay? Yes, yes, I, I want to stay at home. I don't like being in the hospital. I want to be here. I want to be here with my family and friends. Well, we'll do our best to look after you at home. But sometimes there are extenuating circumstances or complications that occur and we can't look after you at home. But I can admit you directly to the palliative care unit at the hospital. You will not have to spend long time in eMERGE at all. You'll go straight to the ward. The other option is to admit you to the residential hospice. Most people are able to be looked after at home, but I want to reassure you that if something should come up, we have some options. Now I need to tell you about my role. I'm here to support both of you. I'll be visiting you every week. 
And if you have any concerns that arise, you can call me. In fact, I have a sheet that I'll leave with you, Jake. And it gives a list of the doctors that support me. And there are two important phone numbers here for you. One are office numbers with the office hours, and one the pager number for off hours. So you can always get a physician. Just one little hint. Don't use the pager number in the daytime. We turn it off. <laughs> I know you have phone numbers for the nurses, and they can be reached 24 hours a day. The phone number is on the front of the chart. But we're going to do our very best to manage your symptoms. And I have to tell you that if we manage your symptoms well, you'll feel better and you'll function better. Now, tell me what's been happening. Tell me about your disease. Well, I have stomach cancer. It seems so unfair, really. They they took so long to diagnose it, and now there's nothing they can do. I'm so sorry. That's really tough. I wonder, is there something you'd like to share with me? Something that you'd like to ask me? How long do I have to live? Well, that's a really good question. Have you been noticing any changes, any differences in the disease over the past month? Can you tell me what's been happening? Well, my appetite's down, and I have no energy. And of course, I've had to wear the oxygen day and night now. Well, these are signs that the disease is changing. These are signs that there's a progression. And I'm sorry, but you're going to gradually get more and more tired and eventually you won't feel like eating and you won't feel like drinking. And that's okay. What about starting an IV if that happens? Well, that, Jake, is a very good question. In fact, we get asked that question a lot. What you need to understand that as the disease progresses, the body functions begin to change so that everything, the brain, the heart, the gastrointestinal tract, the stomach, and the kidneys all begin to slow down. And when these organs stop working, if we were to start an intervenous, we would overload her and in fact make her sicker. So that's the reason that we don't do it. And I'm glad you asked the question because it's really hard and dealing with this because we who are well feel hungry, we feel thirsty, and we can't understand why Marie doesn't feel it. In fact, sometimes all we want to do is make her eat or drink. And that wouldn't be the right thing to do. And it's really, really hard to watch someone we love so dearly get sicker and sicker. As you listen to what we've talked about, are you worried? Well, I'm worried about the pain. And I'm worried about the shortness of breath. But... I'm not worried about dying. Are you having pain now? Uh, almost none. Well, I notice you fidgeting around in the chair a bit. Are you sure you're not having pain? Maybe just a little discomfort, yeah. Ah, well, let's talk about discomfort. If 10 is the worst discomfort you could imagine, and zero is none, how much discomfort are you having? <laughs> well... I guess about an eight. Well, thank you for being honest. Now, I see over here beside you there are some dilated pills for pain. Have you been taking them? Well, I take them once or twice a day, but uh, I don't like them. They make me feel funny. I can't take uh, any morphine or strong medication. I can't tolerate that, but I just don't like taking pills. Well, I'll tell you what we could do for you. Instead of giving you pills, and pills that are really hard to cut, I could prescribe you the same medication in a liquid form. And so then we could give tiny doses every hour and gradually increase the dose in order to keep you from having side effects, but at the same time to relieve your pain symptoms. And the other good thing about taking this, and this is really important, it also will decrease your sensation of being short of breath. Oh, yes. That would be good. Well, we'll write a prescription and we'll make it happen. What about your sleeping? Are you sleeping? Oh, I'm not sleeping well. 
I'm up several times a night, aren't I? Maria, I see you have here some Ativan. Have you been taking the Ativan? I, I don't like taking that. I like to be in control. Are you afraid? Are you afraid you might not wake up? Well, like I said, I like to be in control. Well, how about trying this? How about trying an Ativan when you go to bed at night? And the new prescription of Dilaudid that I'm going to send over, start with a small dose of that as well and see if it doesn't make you sleep better. We know if you get a comfortable sleep, you'll be more rested, you'll feel better, and you'll function better. Okay, uh, I'll try it. Now, what about the bowels? Have they been working? Have you had a good bowel movement? Yes, fine. Uh, I had a good movement yesterday. I'm pleased to hear that. Maria, I notice that you're sleeping with your husband in a regular bed down the hall. And you're lying flat. But you're, with your disease, you need to be sitting up. You breathe much better when you're sitting up. So there are a few things that I'd like to suggest that might make things a little easier for both of you. First of all, I'll contact your case manager at CCAC. And we'll see if we can have a nurse coming in every day. She can monitor your breathing, check on the pain control, and help if there are any other symptoms that you're having. And I'd like to order a commode. Now, I know most people reject that, but it's a tough walk down the hall to the bathroom. And the other thing, the big thing, is your breathing. You really need to be sitting up like you are now in the wheelchair, and it's very hard at night if you have to lie flat. I'd like to order a hospital bed because it's electric. We can have you sitting up and you could sleep much more comfortably. In fact, it would be really good to have it right here in this room. You could look out the window. You could listen to the sounds going on as the family cooked dinner. And Jake, I think you could sleep right here beside her on the couch. I'd also like to contact an occupational therapist because they can help come in and make sure that what you're doing is conserving energy and that makes it easier on your breathing. So an occupational therapist would be helpful as well. And the last thing, I'd like to order a symptom management kit. It's a kit we have on hand with it, a variety of drugs to help handle a variety of situations in an emergency and the nurse has them to use. Sometimes if something happens in the middle of the night or off hours, it's hard to get them. So it would be really helpful if we had that on hand, if that would be all right. Now we've made some decisions today, and if these decisions aren't the right ones, then you can give me a call and we'll make a new decision. I think these are all very good ideas and it'll help us to keep you comfortable. Well, we've gone through a lot of stuff today. Marie, you have to be exhausted. So it's time for me to leave. I'll see you next week. And if you need me, you know how to get a hold of me. Hi, Marie. How are you? Well, I am feeling a little bit better. I'm managing to take the lower dose of medication. And uh, more frequently, and I have less side effects, but my shortness of breath is getting worse. I'm proud of you for taking that medication. And I can understand that you're feeling the shortness of breath. The Dilaudid, the pain medication, does help relieve the symptom of difficult breathing. But there are some other things that we can do to help make you more comfortable. We can get a fan and put it right here in the room and have it blowing on your face and it'll make you feel more comfortable. Sometimes it's helpful to open a window or the door and even putting a cold cloth on your forehead. That can make you feel more comfortable. So we'll give these things a try. Now Marie, last week we talked a little bit about the progression of your disease and the symptoms that were happening with it. About you not wanting to eat, and not wanting to drink, and about the disease progressing. And this disease is going to continue, and it's not going to get better, and eventually your heart will stop. 
This is what we expect the natural progression of your disease to be. And I need to talk to you about something. It's about calling 911. If 911 were called, the emergency services would not be able to bring you back to health. And this would be traumatic for your family. This is a time when you need your family around you. You need to feel their love, their support, and their time with you. Well, there is a tool that we have that can help you. It's called the DNRC. And that's a little form that we'll sign and we'll put it in the chart, in the nursing chart. And should 911 be called, this can be shown to them if you decide you want to do that and they would not do any of the resuscitation procedures. Now you have to know there are times when you might need 911. So there is a role for the, for the ambulance. Now, Marie, how are you feeling about allowing the natural progression of your disease and not calling 911 in order to resuscitate you? Absolutely, yeah. I don't want that. You know, Marie, you've been given some precious time. And Jake, it's good for you to know this too. This is a time when you can tell stories about yourself, stories that they may not know about you. It's also a wonderful time to share your love for each other. And there's something else I wanted to bring up. We have wonderful hospice volunteers. Having a hospice volunteer come would give Jake a break, time to go out for a walk, time to run some errands, and an important time for you to share with the volunteers. They're, they're wonderfully trained, and sometimes you can say things that you might find uncomfortable to say with your family. So. If it's all right with you, I would phone the hospice case coordinator, have her come and have a visit, and set up a volunteer for you. Yes, that would be fine. So I will call the case manager at CCAC and give her an update of what we talked about today. It's important for her to know that. Now I want to talk to you about something else. Not only does the one who has the disease suffer, but the one standing by your side, Jake, suffers as well. And I wondered if it would be okay with you if I had a few words with Jake on the way out. Yes, I understand. Yeah, that would be good. Well, I'll take my leave of you now. You've been just wonderful. I'll be back next week. You can call me if you need me. It's been good to spend time with you today. Bye-bye. Jake, I've been worried about you. How are you feeling? I've been doing okay. But I feel totally helpless. I, I just can't stand to see your suffering and in pain. You know, it's really hard when you feel like there's nothing that you can do. But you need to know how absolutely powerful your love and support is. Not only that, you're giving her a wonderful gift. You're allowing her to die at home. And that, that presence of familiar surroundings, of being with you guys, is absolutely important. And even that little dog of yours running around cheers her up and makes her feel better. But Jake, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what can happen near the end. I already mentioned to both of you about her getting sleepier, she will become unconscious and her breathing will change. And she may have some regular breathing and then it stops. And you'll even think she may be gone. And then the breathing starts again. Also, at this time, it's not uncommon to hear a gurgling sound in the back of her throat. And I have to tell you, that's very distressing. But I want to reassure you she will not be feeling any pain. She will not be distressed. Jake, at this time, it's important to take her hand, put your mouth close to her ear, tell her that you love her. She will sense your presence and know that you're there and that will be reassuring to you and to her. This is often a time when families feel panicky. Don't call 911 but call your nurse. 
you have her number. She will come, she will help you. She will do the proper documentation about Marie's death. She will help you make arrangements with the funeral home so that they can do their part and they will be coming to, to pick up uh, Marie. And she can just be with you and comfort you during that time. It's a time that you do not have to be afraid. Jake, sometimes it can be helpful to talk with your wife about what she'd like at her funeral. Hymns, a favorite song, a reading, a poem. And it's comforting often to sit down and have a chat like that. So don't be afraid to do it. I want to tell you, Jake, you're doing a wonderful job. I know it's a struggle, but it's absolutely amazing what you're doing. And if it weren't for you, Marie wouldn't be able to have her wish to die here at home. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly. I don't know how we could have managed without your help. Jake, it's our privilege to serve you and to be a part of this journey with you. I wish we could take these things away, but we can't. It's time for me to go. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye for now. It's extremely rewarding for me. Um, each time I take care of a patient and family, you get to know them on a level that you may not experience in other settings when you're a nurse. You can spend as much time with patients and families to try to identify with them what their needs are, how you can help them, and where they want their care to happen. And I think that's uh, most important. Uh, my mother moved in with us approximately five years ago, and she was diagnosed with uh, cancer, uh, some form of a skin cancer. And through the past five years, we um, went to various uh, specialists. We found it um, pretty tough and, uh, and a large commitment. And um, I was using vacation days to take mom to the three different places. When you go to a hospital or when we were going through it with Robin's dad, it was, um, you have to wolf your dinner down, you have to get there, you have to spend as much time as you can because people are cognizant and not cognizant and you want to spend time with them. Uh, it's 20 bucks to park every time you go. Uh, my mother-in-law, I was more involved um, in taking her for her radiation treatments when she was going down there every day and sitting with her through that whole experience. Um, and it was very frustrating because I could see her getting sicker and sicker and sicker every day and I kept saying to the doctors, why are we putting her through this? Why this seems to be worse than, than, than the disease ever was. Um, she was, wasn't eating, she was throwing up, she was losing weight. She was, it, was, it was horrible, a horrible time for her. Um, and she was embarrassed and she was losing her hair and she was just, it was just a very frustrating time and not getting any answers. She, she never complained. She was always a happy person and, and you'll, she, she loved life and she enjoyed everything about it. And, and as time went on and she fought, she fought in the beginning. She wanted to live. She didn't want to die. She wanted to beat this disease. So she was quite willing to go out to all these appointments and different doctors. And, but in the past year, she really got tired of that. It was, it was time to either fix it or let her go. She was she was ready. In the end, she was the one that said, I don't want to go anymore. Please don't make me go anymore. And uh, finally, at the end, uh, we met the palliative care team, Dr. Kelly and Amanda, and mom passed away at home. Brad's mom really wanted to die at home. She, she was very clear on that, and we promised her that we would allow that. But we didn't even know how we were going to do that until we met the palliative team. So when they started coming and they, they assured us that they could make her comfortable and keep her at home and we would have all the medications and everything available to us, it, it, it was just a very, it was a very gentle time then. It became um, easier for her and it was easier for us because people could come and go anytime they wanted. They didn't have to pay for parking. They just pulled up in the driveway. They could have a cup of tea and sit with her and... Um, and so and that part was nice. It was very nice. It was very peaceful. And 
I stayed with her um, right till the very end. I, Brad had a really hard time at that point. He knew, we knew she was dying that night and I just sat with her with the dog, her little dog. And, uh, and very peacefully she just went to sleep just after two in the morning. So um, I was glad that I could be there for her. <laughs> but um, I wouldn't have done it any other way. <laughs> The palliative care team I can't say enough about. They were amazing, um, supportive, helpful. I would definitely recommend palliative care to anybody who's going through what we went through. I only wish that we had met them sooner. Palliative care is a wonderful, humbling experience in caring for someone who is dying. It's a privilege to be with them and to give them emotional, physical, and spiritual support during this difficult time.